Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Family Roots in Poland webinar presented jointly by the Kościuszka Foundation and the project on Poland past and present. My name is Ewa Zadworna. I'm Vice President and Director of Cultural Affairs of the Kościuszka Foundation. And it is my great pleasure to welcome our distinguished guest speakers, Professor Norman Davies and Lord Daniel Finkelstein. Professor Davies surely needs no introduction to our regular viewers or anyone interested in Polish history. However, for the purpose of these introductory remar remarks, let me introduce him as a pioneer and preeminent historian of Poland, whose body of work significantly contr contributed to increasing knowledge about Poland nowadays in the English speaking world. Professor, the Professor Davis is the author of God's Playground, considered the best and most comprehensive survey of Polish history written in English. And he's also the author of dozens of other books and publications and on Poland and Europe's history. Professor Davis is a former chair at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at the University of London, where he taught Polish history for a quarter of a century. He also lectured on Poland's and Europe's history at some of the leading universities in many countries in Europe, America, and Asia. Professor Davis is the recipient of many honors and distinctions in Great Britain and Poland, including the Fellowship of the British Academy and the Poland's highest recognition, which is the Order of the White Eagle. Lastly, I would like to also introduce Professor Davis as an honorary trustee of the Kościuszka Foundation. And today he is joined by Lord Daniel Finkelstein, a leading British journalist, associate editor, and weekly political columnist for the Times. Lord Finkelstein has been a member of the British House of Lords since 2013. He has held various vital advisory roles within the Conservative Party and was nominated political commentator of the year on four occasions. In 1997, he was awarded an Order of the British Empire. Lord Finkelstein has Polish roots, and as the title of this webinar indicates, today's discussion will be about his search for his family roots in Poland. Today's presentation is the last episode in the Studying Poland Today webinar series, uh, which was, has, been, has been presented jointly by the Kościuszka Foundation and the Project on Poland Past and Present, which aim is to promote knowledge and better understanding about the Poland. The first episode, held in September last year, featured Professor Robert Frost leading a discussion with Professor Davies about the 60 years of studying Poland. And today's final episode features Professor Davies leading a discussion about Lord Finkelstein's way of learning about Poland. The recording of all previous episodes in this series are available on the Foundation's YouTube channel. This webinar is also being recorded and will be the recording will be posted on the YouTube so you can rewatch it later on. As usual, following the discussion, we'll open for Q&A and we invite attendees questions and comments. Please direct your questions to a Q&A feature. We'll get back to them later on. Uh, and now, uh, Professor Davies, Lord Finkelstein, a big welcome to you. Uh, we are giving you a virtual applause. Thank you very much for, for doing this. And now, Professor Davies, I'm uh, turning this webinar over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eva, for those kind words um, and uh, introduction to both of us. Um, my ears pricked up when I heard um, that Daniel Finkelstein was writing uh, a biography of his paternal grandfather, uh, who had been a, a prominent industrialist in Lvov. Now, of course, Lviv in Ukraine. Uh, my own wife's family came from Lvov, so, um, I have a keen interest in, um, in that part of the world. I also read that uh, your grandfather had been imprisoned uh, in 1939 to 40 in the notorious NKVD camp at Staro, uh, Starobielsk. Uh, is that correct? Um, and does it mean that um, your grandfather had been one of the, the Polish officers 
um, murdered in the um, in the Katyn massacres in 1940. No, not quite. So, first of all, th thank you so much for inviting me. It uh, gives me a chance to to thank you, uh, <laughs> Professor, for the sort of intellectual capital that you've given everybody who uh, who's interested in this area. I've been a, a, a long time admirer, so it's um, I've been a thrill actually to, to to be connected with you over these last few months uh, and to do this event. Um, the uh, the answer to your question is that what my my grandfather was arrested on the 13th of April of the I'm sorry on the 9th of April 1940 so right. he, he was not among the officers who he did go to Starobios but he was not among the officers who were arrested after the battle for the city um my grandfather my father did have a close friend Aldona uh, Panet, whose whose stepfather uh, Ignatius Schraga was one of the officers. Major Ignatius Schraga was one of the officers, and ultimately was killed in the Katyn massacre. And in the book that I've written, uh, Ignatius plays a role, um, and the story of Katyn is told. But my grandfather arrived in Starobielsk in the autumn of 1940. He was arrested. Uh, he was first in prison in Lvov. Um, for about two months, uh, he then was in prison in um, in in other part in among other places, Kharkov, and he ended up in um, Starobielsk um, right at the end of that. And it's in Starobielsk that he then receives his sentence to the Gulag, which would ultimately have right. killed him were, were, were it not for the for the fact that Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in a in a uh, act we're all familiar with, and he was then released um as part of the uh, amnesty good thank you for um that's, that's very interesting um i'll come back to all that in a minute um but i also know that your mother's family the Wieners, uh, have a very prominent place in the holocaust story uh, your mother i think was a classmate of anne frank well my, my uh, mother in, Yes, yeah, sorry, carry on, yeah. yeah. Go on, go on. Uh, I, I, I am I'm repeating things I've seen in interviews, but uh, uh, I know she was in Amsterdam and uh, um, was familiar with Anne Frank, at least. Yes. And her father was a founder of the uh, famous Wiener Library uh, of Holocaust Studies in Russell Square in London, uh, where I used to work um, at one time. Um, in other words, your paternal side of your family were victims of Soviet crimes and the maternal side of Nazi crimes. Uh, that, I must say, is a very Polish combination. <laughs> um, uh, do you feel any sense of balance or imbalance in the way that those two sets of crimes are usually presented? Absolutely. So first of all, let me just give a quickly recap. You, you've done it yeah. uh, characteristically very well. Um, but um, the, my, my grandfather, Alfred Wiener, was one of the leaders of German Jews in the 1920s. Um, he had to leave Germany to go to Holland in 1933 because he was collecting material on the Nazis and they wanted him to destroy it. Um, they actually ultimately succeeded in getting him to destroy it, but he started again in Holland. And then the Dutch felt he endangered their neutrality and he came here, set up the Wiener Library. Unfortunately, he didn't bring the family with because they thought that Holland would be neutral um, and therefore would not be invaded, It'd be like Switzerland. Uh, in, the, in Holland, there was a, a community of German Jewish refugees, of which my grandfather and the children were one, and Anne Frank, Otto Frank, and Margot and Anne were, were another. So they belonged to the same synagogue, they knew each other. My grand, my aunt Ruth and Margot were together in the uh, famous Lyceum school. Uh, if you go into the Anne Frank house, you can see a, uh, a, a sort of request by their, one of their schools to declare uh, the children of Jewish blood uh, and one of the people on it is Anne, is Margot Frank, and another is my is my aunt Ruth. Um, and my mother and, and and Ruth also saw Anne and Margot when they arrived in in Belsen as well. So um, they did know the Frank family, and they had that story in the Holocaust. And I and my book is um, the the working title of it is Hitler, Stalin, Mum and Dad. Uh, and it tells the story. <laughs> 
and it tells the story of Hitler, of, of, the, of Hitler's crimes and Stalin's, and they hardly touch, except for one small thing, which is that um, the person who helps to create the passports which freed my mother was a Pole, was a Polish ambassador called Alexander Vadosh, and Vadosh was actually in school with my paternal grandfather. So there's a light touching uh, between these two stories, but only light. Um, right at the end of my, my uh, manuscript, because it's not yet a book, um, I, I reflect on the fact that my mother then did began to, begun at the end of her life to tell story about the Holocaust. And she went to 10 Downing Street and told the story there. And um, she did a BBC program. And they, I often did programs about her and Anne Frank. And nobody ever came to ask my father about his uh, experiences but I think my book is um the way I would describe it is my mother has a very unusual version of a well-known story um so her grandfather her father was such an unusual individual the Paraguayan passports is so extraordinary that is an unusual version of a well-known story which is the story of the Nazi Holocaust my father's story is a standard version of an almost unknown story so my, my father was in the way that lots of people on this call will be familiar with uh, arrested um, after my grandfather was sent to the gulag eventually my grandfather is sentenced for being an antisocial element under the ukrainian penal code my grandfather and his mother uh, were deported to kazakhstan i mean everyone calls it siberia but as we know it was it wasn't kazakhstan or the siberian borderlands and they were in a collective farm um and nobody ever tells that story. And uh, the the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact is the um, the sort of spark for everything in the book: the invasion of Poland, but also the invasion of Holland. Um, and um, it is, you know, they were they were. Whenever we think about whether the crimes of Stalin and Hitler are comparable, what we don't consider is whether or not the crimes in, of Hitler and Stalin were the same uh, in, in certain respects. And in certain certain moments, they were they were co-conspirators in the same crime. But the, the best historian on that, be, you know, the best historians on, on, on that present company accepted is it have been Roger Morehouse in his Devil's Alliance. It's very well expressed. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Well, um... I was talking to a, a um, lady professor at Oxford uh, only after lunch and uh, talking about um, the Anders army and the deportations to Siberia. And uh, as you suggest, she'd never heard of it. It's not a story that um, uh, even you know, well-educated British people know. Um, uh, I've noticed from your uh, column that you are very concerned about Putin's war in Ukraine and are very aware of Putin's spurious historical theories that are fu fueling that conflict. In one of the, in one of the interviews I found you uh, seem to suggest that the antidote to those theories was Holocaust education. I, I think I know what you meant, but it makes me wonder whether the best antidote might not be a somewhat wider recipe along the lines of Timothy Snyder's Bloodlands, yes. which would embrace the tragedies of all the peoples of the region, uh, naturally including Poles, Ukrainians, uh, and Jews. What is your response to that sort of? Well, it's a correct critique. So to, to, to excuse myself for a second, that first, um, the, 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 the quote I think you gave about Holocaust education was in a piece specifically for the Jewish Chronicle, so I was dealing with that, um, with, with that. But, I, but I agree strongly. Um, I, I would have written a column calling for uh, precisely uh, the relationship that you talk between history and the, uh, the crimes of Putin. Only David Aronovich wrote it first, and it's one of the rules in, in column writing. It's you know point having a three letter, uh, a three letter, a, tr a treble uh, letter score square that's available, and having a Z. It has to be your turn, um, and uh, that's what happened to me. It wasn't my turn, and David Aronovich wrote it, so I couldn't. But um, I, I do think that not talking about Katyn, um, not not talking about what Stalin did to uh, to the to the Poles, the attempt to destroy the Polish elite, uh, that is, um, I, I think, 
definitely connected to uh, to Putin's ability to carry out this crime. And very few people know the history of um, of Lvov or Lviv or Lemberg, uh, however you want to uh, refer to it. And um, I think if more people did, it would have made it more difficult. Good, thank you. Um, in preparation for this conversation, I looked up your Wikipedia entry, dangerous thing to do, and noted that the entry opens with a statement, a bold statement that Daniel Finkelstein is Jewish. Uh, I don't know whether or not you yourself control uh, the Wikipedia entry, but I would have thought in identity matters, you would have been a prime example, not for one strong identity, but for multiple identity. You are at one at the same time, extremely British, as well as being proudly Jewish. Yes. Or am I wrong? Also, seeing the origins in Poland of half your ancestry, do you not admit to a Polish strand as well? I absolutely do. So first of all, um, you're talking to someone who was brought up with a with a clock of Mar Marshall Pilsudski that played the first brigade <laughs> song on the hour um, uh, in the on the dining room shelf. Um, uh, so um, being my, my father, in fact, very late in his life, always said he refused to claim Polish citizenship because he said he'd never stop being a Polish citizen. And he refused to accept that that's what had happened to him, which I, which I completely historically understand and accept actually. Uh, there's a very strong Polish strand. And it was one of the things that my father, my father um, at the end of his life, um, he had a you know kind of quite a gentle death. And we had a period um, where we could talk about you know what he thought about various things we talked so much anyway there wasn't much left to talk about but one of the things that he always was very keen on was to stress uh how important it was to him that i was nice to the poles and uh, and um that we were that we had polish origin it was very important to him and, uh, and of course the background to this is having my grandfather um dolu adolf having served in the anders army he he goes he when he leaves um the uh on the train from the camp after opera after barbarossa uh to find the uh anders army uh and he goes on the train he arrives and he is quizzed about uh his background and he says he's asked um about his ethnic origin and he says he's jewish and the interviewer says to him why do you want to join the army and he said because i'm polish and it's my fight and he's registered as Polish because, as we know, the Russians were keen um, that people of ethnic origin, uh, Jewish origin, were not accepted as being no. Polish in order that they didn't cede the territorial claim they made over Lvov. So um, the uh, and actually that later on in the story, there are there is a time where where when they're going on the boat that takes them from. On the, across the Caspian Sea from the uh, from the from Uzbekistan over into uh, Iran, and when they arrive at the port, uh, the Russians have worked out that my family is Jewish, and they create these two lists: list A, which was Poles, and list B, which were Jews, on which only my grandmother and my father were listed. And my grandmother turned to the people on the dockside and just said, list B comes first, turned to a Russian soldier and said, carry my bags. And <laughs> my grandmother was quite an imposing person, always had been, but was toughened by her experience in the collective farm. And the Russian soldier walked behind her carrying the bags and they walked onto the boat first. Um, so it's an interesting relationship between, but my grandfather on on my mother's side also insisted on being a German Jew. He was a German and a Jew. And the two things he thought went together. And he wasn't, mm. he wasn't entirely disillusioned of that view by what happened in the Second World War. Uh, but it was actually quite a blow, obviously, to those of us who believe in integrationism. Mm. No, very interesting. Uh, from what I know, the, uh, in uh, the Stalin-Soviet Union, the 
NKVD had official uh, l nationality lists, uh, and uh, one nationality, of course, was Russian, uh, but another was Polish, and uh, a third was Jewish. You were, could be uh, officially Jewish, um, and I think uh, that's why they um, they thought it inappropriate for Jews to join the Polish army, just as they uh, tried to prevent Ukrainians um, or, or Belarusians, Polish yeah. citizens, who who were also Ukrainians from joining. Um, but uh, it, this brings me back, back to your grandfather in pre-war Wolf, prominent industrialist. Uh, from what I know, he must have been a highly assimilated person within the city's predominantly Polish population, along the lines advocated by the Jewish Enlightenment, and similar, as it were, to your own position uh, within uh, British society. Uh, we know that Zionists, uh, who were becoming very vocal in the 1930s, were strongly opposed to assimilation, thinking that it was watering down traditional Jewry. But I wonder if you know how your father would have described himself, for example, in the census of 1931, which was based on language criteria. Uh, did Grandpa Finkelstein think of himself as a Pole, uh, as an Austrian, as a Jew, or uh, most probably as all three? <laughs> it's very interesting. So I don't know for certain the answer to that, but I think the answer is Pole. Um, and the reason for thinking that is my father's very strong insistence on being Polish uh, and the fact that uh, all of my mother's grandmother's correspondence with my grandfather is in Polish that I have, including, right. including pre-war correspondence. So not just the correspondence that went between them when they were in the Anders army, also all the correspondence from Lwów to, um, to the uh, collective farm was also in Polish. It could have been in German, but it wasn't. Um, so I am of the view that they saw themselves as Poles. The only contrary evidence was the claim that my grandmother made in the 1960s, where she attempts to get the German, successfully to get the German, to get German uh, recompense. Uh, and during that, they stressed that they had a German library, they owned property in Vienna, they'd, they'd had a German nanny. Um, they stressed that. But I, so that's the, that's the only reason for uncertainty. But my grandfather um, contributed to a statue that was never built, that was a sort of Polish Statue of Liberty that was going to be built. Um, and they collected money. He saw himself as a multi ethnic supporter of the broad vision of Pilsudski is the way that I the way that I see as partic mm -hmm. particularly he certainly wasn't a Zionist um, because he wanted for example he was very involved in the creation of housing in, in uh, for unemployed people in uh, Lvov and the Zionists thought that it was a waste of money of Jewish money to spend Jewish money building houses in Poland, right? Because they wanted to get out of Poland and my grandfather mm -hmm. didn't agree with that. Mm -hmm. Oh, very interesting, thank you. Um, now for the Anders army, uh, which to my mind was a fine example of pre-war Polish in inclusiveness and diversity, uh, since it contained large cohorts of Ukrainian, Jewish, Yellow Russian soldiers, as well as ethnic Poles. Uh, famously, one of its sergeants was Menahem Begin, the future Prime Minister of Israel. Uh, your father, Ludwig Finkelstein, born 1920 in the Wolf, was of military age in 1939 uh, and joined General Anders when his army was formed in wartime Russia. Uh, Ludwig's mother, your mat uh, paternal grandmother, also traveled, if I'm not mistaken, under the protection of the Anders army from Russia to Palestine. 
so, as you know, I've written a book uh, about the Anders Army, and among other countries I visited, uh, uh, I visited Israel on the Anders Trail, only to find that most Israelis we met knew hardly anything about the Anders Army or about the circumstances which led to its formation. The Katyn massacres, the deportations, the Gulag, the evacuation to the Middle East and so on. Uh, what are your own experiences, your views about all of that? Well, so first of all, Dad was actually a bit younger than that. He was born in 1929. So he wasn't old enough oh. to be in the Anders Army. Um, but my grandfather, despite the fact that he ends up, you know, he was he he was 50 in 1940. So he he was on the old side. He ends up being the quartermaster for the Anders Army. And when the Anders Army moves to um, moves its headquarters, he helps uh, to uh, to supply. His job was always supply. So right. No. Uh -huh. uh, so he he was so my father and my grandmother were both um camp followers of the anders army although so when my grandfather dolu was in iraq they remain in palestine eventually dolu is re uh dolu becomes too old to be really a serving officer and he is sent to do to run training courses um for the idea is that with his accountancy and uh and um business knowledge and his ability he would be then very good at helping administer areas which the allied forces took over and he's sent to help train that he does a bit of quartermastering during that period as well but that's that was his main uh, role he also had to take time quite a bit of time off from the army because like a lot of people who ended up in the anders army and you you know you've written about this very eloquently yourself they were in a terrible condition by the time they reached uh, you know, they, they got together. And um, my grandfather, although he lived for 10 years after 1940, he died in, he didn't die till 1950. Um, he, uh, it's as if the Gulag killed him directly, um, in my opinion. He never well, that, that's very true. And um, uh, I, people don't know, but I think there were more of Anders's soldiers that died in uh, Uzbekistan from disease that, that, that died at uh, Monte Cassino. Yes. Um, uh, as I'm sure you know, Polish-Jewish relations are a complex subject, which sometimes arouse strong emotions on both sides. Uh, among the friends and colleagues whom I greatly admire are men and women who see no problem in marrying their Polishness and their Jewishness with no bother at all. Uh, we must have some common acquaintances, I'm sure, in that category. Uh, my own guide in those matters was the late Raphael Schaff, a Krakowian and a Londoner with a superb knowledge of Polish literature. So having you on the spot, as it were, uh, what would you say are the main obstacles to improving Polish-Jewish relations? Okay, well, at, at first I should say, I'm, I, <clears throat> in, in striking the balance, I, I, I strike a strongly pro-Pol, um, balance. I have no trouble in understanding why it infuriates Poles to be um, seen as if they were in some way instigators of um, the uh, Holocaust rather than the victims of Hitler and Stalin, which clearly they were. Um, I think it's historically incredibly illiterate, that view, and um, ignores a lot of what Poles suffered, both from the Nazis and from the Soviets. Uh, and I can understand why it infuriates a country not to not to have its own substantial sacrifices um, understood. Secondly, my my family's own experience with with Poland was a strongly positive one. My grandfather in 1938 had built a a massive house on the hill in in Herbert of Herbertov in uh, Lvov, um, which is still standing, and it was clearly one he, he intended to stay living in for generations. Um, 
so that that is my starting position there's no however there's no getting away from two things that i think are important the first is there's no doubt that um there was and strong anti-semitism in Lvov before the um before the second world war uh you can read that the the story of the killing of the students that had taken place the fate you know the, the forcing of jewish students to be at the back in uh in the school benches in the universities and the quotas and um you know those things really did exist uh and that was problematic and and secondly there are there are some reasonable critiques of the extent of domestic resistance of um to of the nazis by poles however i would add into this a perspective of my mother's which is which is that there are often criticisms of the jewish community's response in in amsterdam some of them by friends of my grandfather's my maternal grandfather's uh and uh, you know, were they robust enough? Hannah Arendt's critique, you know, was which was, uh, if only they'd done more to resist, then not, some of this might not have happened. And my my mother said it, the Nazis were to blame, and I and I, I, I strongly share that view. So I, um, there is no question that there remains uh, in Poland a strand of anti-Semitism that we need to you know, identify and to argue with and to not shy away from criticizing. Um, there's no doubt that that strand existed in history. Um, but I, my starting point is as um, a friend of Poland and a uh, descendant of Poles. Mm -hmm. Very good. Uh, you've actually answered um the question I was about to uh, present uh, as well. So that, let, let's move on. Um, uh, I've often quoted the fact that 85% of the Jews alive today can trace their origins to the old Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, which was the principal refuge for Jews in Europe uh, for centuries. Uh, 250 years ago, uh, before the uh, Commonwealth was destroyed by its neighbors, uh, there were no Russian Jews, no German Jews, no French Jews, no Spanish Jews, and very few British or Austrian Jews. Uh, I've heard this fact emphasized by uh, very reputable Jewish historians, yet I always wonder how well it is appreciated by the Jewish community itself. Um, when I was teaching uh, uh, about Eastern Europe uh, in American universities, I would always um, ask my students, um, uh, especially Jewish kids, uh, where their grandmothers came from. Uh, and the replies uh, were usually not too accurate. I remember a group of, um, of three students in a class in Stanford, one of whom said his grandmother came from Austria, uh, a second uh, said from Ukraine, and a third uh, said from Poland. So I told them to come back next week and tell me something more exact. And the next week, one of them came and said, uh, grandmother came from Lemberg, the second said from Lviv, and the third, of course, said from Lvov. And none of them knew that their, all those grandmothers uh, um, came from exactly the same place. Uh, do you have any stories like that? Um, so what stories like what? I... Well, uh, the... the, the um, uh, the, the sort of lack of knowledge. You, um, oh, you're, yeah, you're, I, you said, that, for example, that your mother's family were German Jews, but yes. uh, they were German Jews in the 19th century. If you go back one step from that, uh, they were undoubtedly in, from Poland. Yeah, so... Uh, they couldn't yeah. be from anywhere else. Yeah, I, I don't know that I don't really... I don't, I don't really have it 
have such a thing. I mean, because so I don't, I don't think there is much knowledge about any of about this. I've I've certainly encountered a lot of lack of knowledge of all the story um, about Poland and you know Lvov and Lviv and Lemberg, people not not really understanding those things. I've encountered that. I haven't really encountered, you know, I haven't really discussed that particular issue, really. Uh -huh. Good. Uh, um, uh, I, I found uh, asking uh, Jewish kids, you know, where, where their family came from, a lot of them said from Russia. And then you, you say, well, we're in Russia. And half of them would say Warsaw. Um, but they... Uh, you know, they didn't put this all together. Um, and the, uh, as it were, the awareness that uh, Poland had been the great reservoir of, of Jewish life for centuries be before they were, uh, you know, dispersed in the 19th centuries um, is very striking. Um, the theme of our webinar this last year has been billed either as Polish studies or as learning about Poland. Uh, for it's my contention that the level of informed knowledge about Poland in Western countries is pretty weak and needs to be actively improved, especially in universities. I've even created a small foundation to promote the idea. It's a complicated topic and has taken eight sessions uh, to outline some of the major aspects. Uh, one strand which seems to cause confusion is the apparent divorce between the various groups uh, whose forebears once lived together in a multinational Poland uh, long departed. Uh, in emigration, as in the UK or the USA, Poles and Germans or Poles and Jews or Poles and Lithuanians or Poles and Ukrainians uh, rarely communicate about common problems. And in the educational field, they all seem to follow their own interests. Uh, as an official wise man as, as you are, do you have a remedy for this state of, uh, of affairs, this divorce between the different communities who once were familiar with each other? No, I mean, I think, I think, you know, we can all just chip away at it and your work is part of doing that. And so is my, hopefully my book. I'm hoping that, um, you know, I'm hoping that uniting the story of the Holocaust with the story of what happened to the Poles um, and, you know, explain to people what Katyn which is a name people have heard of, but they don't necessarily know what it is, what that was. Um, explaining to people about the deportation, which they generally don't know. Um, explain to people about, you know, Stalin's invasion of Poland in 1939, which they kind of only vaguely understand about. That all of, I'm hoping that that will be a, uh, you know, would be part of chipping away at this lack of knowledge in all parts of the community. I've never, I mean, the truth is people are ignorant about lots of things. Um, mm -hmm. And so I never get too upset about them being ignorant of this. Uh, but the best thing we can do is to try our best just to uh, bring this front of mind, really. And that's that's what we're mm -hmm. trying to do. Yeah, one, one thing which I'm keen on is, is we're encouraging the, the, the various groups to talk to each other. We've, um, we had a very good session uh, sort of on Polish-Ukrainian uh, um, contacts, um, which are very prominent now, of course, because of the uh, development. Um, <laughs> but you know, Polish-Jewish um, things are um, another element that we need to um, we need to put forward. Now, um, we, we really been going 45 minutes. I, I skipped one or two questions because um, uh, time was moving fast. Uh, just, just one, if it's not too uh, personal, um, your surname, Finkelstein, is sort of iconically Jewish. Um, I presume uh, invented after the imperial decree of 1787 in Galicia, yes. when the Austrian Empire 
insisted that Jews have surnames like everybody else. Uh, I expect that you're very attached to the name, and I have to say that it, it has a, a certain ring about it. Um, nonetheless, many, uh, uh, many immigrants, refugees to Britain or America decided to change their name to something more conventionally Anglo-Saxon. At the present time, I'm helping a man in Oxford um, who has a very English name, but discovered that his father had changed their name um, shortly after the war uh, and is looking um, uh, into his roots uh, rather like you are. Um, I wonder, was anybody in your family tempted to change their name? Like, is this a, a, something that they talked about? Uh, uh, no, they were not tempted to change their name. And yes, it was something we talked about. Uh, but right. we talked about it in this sense, which is we're never going to do that. Um, <laughs> my, my grandmother was called Mrs. Finn by her language students, uh, but there was never any sense that we would use that more broadly. And one of the uh, reasons is that um, my, my grandfather, Adolf Finkelstein, was a considerable individual. He, he was known as the Iron King. Uh, he had a huge retail, a uh, huge uh, um, wholesale uh, iron and steel business. He was a councillor. Uh, he was a civic leader. Um, and um, he died in a small house in Hendon Central, uh, almost completely broke uh, and also broken by what Solon did to him. Uh, one of my motivations in, in life um, is to bring honour back to his name uh, as a proud Finkelstein. I'm therefore very proud to be in the House of Lords. My brother's been knighted as well. Uh, my sister is a senior civil servant. We, we all explicitly see that as um, restoring the fortune of, of uh, Adolf Finkelstein and Amalia Finkelstein, my grandmother, um, after what was done to them. And I wouldn't want to, um, I wouldn't want to, to dispense with their name. It would ruin three quarters of the point. <laughs> Well, that's, that's lovely to hear, and um, uh, I think the time has come we uh, move on, but uh, you know, before we ask for questions for the audience, is there anything uh, that you would like to, to ask that um, I or other people may, uh, may know? It's, it's, uh, we've been you know, galloping along, um, uh, no, I, I guess, I guess I just wanted to, um, I, I, if I have one, one question, you, you have a strong view, I think, correct, of Anders's uh, sort of multi-ethnic openness. Um, yeah. Would you, would you say that was characteristic of his army um, as well as of him? Uh, uh, no, I wouldn't, certainly not to the same degree. Um, the, in the Anders army, there were some uh, several groups of um, you know, very opinionated uh, people. Uh, there was quite a, um, a bunch of, of endex, as we, <laughs> if you don't like them, that's what you call them, you know, the National Democrats, the Demoski people, uh, who were very hostile to um, uh, no, Jews and Ukrainians, anybody who they regard was not properly Polish. Um, among the Jews, there was an unusual number of um, uh, not just Zionists, you know, but Zionist revisionists like, like Begin. Begin wasn't alone, you know, he, there was quite a lot of them. Uh, and th those are two groups within Anders Army who uh, I imagine had some pretty fierce arguments over the uh, over the over the campfire in in the evening, um, uh, there, there was a um, big group of Ukrainians who came from the same part of the world as your grandfather, rather uh, rural um, Galicia, uh, and um, they had a, a very much trouble with the NKVD, uh, who were, were very unwilling to regard them as, as Poles. So, um, but um, 
Anders' own position was that every citizen of Poland has a right to serve in the army. And he once said, I'm not interested uh, in what they think, but what they do. And, you know, he had um, one or two communists, Polish communists, uh, uh, whom he locked up, or the um, gendarmerie locked up for um, what was regarded as, you know, seditious views. Communists who didn't um, recognize the independence of Poland. Uh, and he had one or two uh, sort of extreme uh, right wingers um, who, one of whom turned out to be, um, you know, a collaborator and crossed the lines and went to Berlin. Um, so uh, they're all sorts. It was a, um, it's a big bunch of people, you know, they, um, uh, nearly 100,000. Um, and uh, you've got um, all groups of uh, uh, from the Polish Republic represented and uh, Anders was in charge of uh, in charge of them uh, but he generally speaking he kept them together and um, uh, that was uh, you know one of his great achievements that they um, uh, they marched on to the end uh, and um, you know uh, all honor to their name. Good. Um, uh, I think we've been going 50 minutes, so but we should have some time for questions. Uh, uh, Eva is still here. <laughs> Thank I you very here. much. Thank you very so, much for the very interesting conversation that I see uh, started inspiring questions from our audience. Uh, anyone who would like to ask any other questions uh, to either uh, Professor Davies or Lord Finkelstein, please uh, place, uh, place it now uh, using the, the Q&A feature. And maybe I'll begin uh, with the question from uh, Peter Szymański, who thanks you for a wonderful, amazing conversation. And he asks, uh, as we are discussing Holocaust education, what do you think of the latest controversy between collective Holocaust memory as described by Israeli ministers versus historical truth as described, as described by Polish ministers and as characterized by the press? Is that, is that a question for me or for Norman? I think you're, you're more skilled in that than I am. Go on. <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. So I, the answer is I'm not. So my, my mother always used to have this phrase about what she used to describe the things that she'd suffered and things that my father had suffered. Um, and she used to say it's not a competition. Right? Uh, and this very much summarised her sensibility and it's mine too. My view is uh, on this of all topics, we ought to be able to um, avoid an argument. Um, we, uh, there's, been, there's plenty of enough suffering to go around, uh, Polish suffering and Jewish suffering, um, I do think it needs to be better understood what Poles suffered. Um, I think that uh, this needs to uh, be explained and uh, people have a very poor historical understanding of it. And I think Jews have a poor historical understanding of it. As somebody brilliantly said to me, and I hadn't really thought about this, um, lots, of the, lots of Jews who survived the Second World War did so because they'd left, they'd left Poland um, before the Second World War. And as a result, um, they often were among the most sort of militantly uh, disaffected um, people. Uh, and uh, the people who were ready to stay, lots of those people were killed by the Germans. Um, and that has probably skewed Jewish uh, views. I do think um, it's important for Poles in their anxiety to emphasise that they were not the uh, that they were not the instigators of the Holocaust, uh, for that not to bleed into denying the crime of individuals or groups of individuals who were involved in those things, um, because they were strongly anti-Semitic, which is just a feature of the history of that period. And but no one needs to do that. There's, we don't need to have a competition as to who. Um, is telling the truth here. There's plenty of truth and plenty of suffering to go round. And I, what would it say of us as human beings if we were not able to uh, to conciliate these different opinions? Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Um, let's perhaps maybe move to a question from Peter Kaspritsky, who asks for any recommendation for family record search for family members on the eastern side of Poland. Um, He's, he adds that majority of residents there were Jew, Jewish before 1890s. Family stories going that far back are silent on any possible Jewish roots. Any any recommendations? Because that's, I'm sure that's a challenge. Right. My, my brother had done some of this work in uh, a few years ago in Polish archives, but I did, uh, sorry, in Lvov archives, but the Lvov archives weren't that helpful, partly uh, because they weren't being helpful, partly because they'd been bombed in different times and lost certain documents. Uh, and so we didn't, find, we had documents that the family had kept. They're obviously, you know, for the later material, the, the Anders Army material, uh, the professor will, will knows about all of that, but, you know, the Hoover uh, collection is amazing. Um, and I did manage to find some information from my father and about my grandfather from that and from the Polish Resettlement Corps archives? Uh, it depends what sort of records you're looking for. Um, and I haven't done as much archival research as um, perhaps I should have done, but um, in relation to Galicia, the Roman Catholic par parishes very often uh, have records of non-Catholic marriages, births and deaths. Um, uh, you know, acting on behalf of the Austrian government. So, um, uh, if if you dig around, you, you can find more than you'd expect. Um, thank you. I mean, the question from Robert Swonka, which uh, actually is very similar to the, the topic and issue in question: Is there any particular, especially treasured document in Lord Finkelstein's archives? Uh, yes. I can answer that question. So when I was doing this uh, piece of work, I had to, it's fat under to my right hand side here. Um, I, I opened a suitcase and there was a little plastic bag in the suitcase with some very uh, tattered pieces of paper, sometimes stained um, and written right to the edge all over the, in Polish, which is, I, I don't speak. Um, but when I got them translated, what they were, were um, about 90 letters written by my mother's siblings, my grandma, I'm sorry, my grandmother's siblings, my grandmother Amalia Lusha Finkelstein, um, to send to them in, the, uh, in Kazakhstan um, that had accompanied or um, followed the food parcels they sent. Those were extraordinary documents. I had them all translated. I mean, lots of them repeat, did you receive the socks? Um, so they're not, they don't, they not have words of great moment, lots of them, but they're still amazing. Thank you. Uh, let me now uh, perhaps refer to a question placed by Ms. Kristina Piurkowska. Uh, she asked whether either of gentlemen could discuss the rationale for the continuing refusal of the British government to make available documents referring to the exit interviews with uh, Colonel Stevenson, Captain uh, Gilder and Frank Strubant, as well as the official report submitted by Stevenson and, uh, and the overt concealment of by the Foreign Office okay, of correspondence from the Madden Committee requesting contact with these men. Uh, one of the, uh, in general terms, I don't, I don't know whether this applies, but it sounds as though it might do. Um, uh, Polish people want access to British intelligence papers. Uh, and when they're refused, they uh, sometimes think that they, they're, this is an exception, but it's the general rule that uh, British intelligence papers are closed for 100 years. Uh, so um, nobody can get access. Um, when I was um, you know, researching the Warsaw Rising, 1944, one of the, uh, the key questions uh, was what the uh, what did the British intelligence know about it or and do about it. But even though I had uh, you no know, good protection, as they say. Uh, I never got got access to what what I needed. So um, 
Uh, I'm afraid I can't help on that particular issue, but the general issue is um, a lot of papers in Britain are um, closed for a hundred years and nobody gets to see them. Um, I must say the, the, the United States is, is actually more open in that, that regard than the Britain is. Uh, I've just noticed that, yes, um, Ms. Kristina Pirkowska earlier asked this question, what are the reasons for the US initially concealing the cut in crime? But this is, yes, what you've just uh, answered and responded. Uh, we do have a question from Michael Yanukovych who asks whether Lord Finkelstein could elaborate on your comments on Putin and Ukraine invasion. Yeah, I can. Of course, I can. So, um, the the there are there are two things. To make a general comment. I do think this is a a, a challenge to the whole of Western uh, liberal democracy um, and uh, the rule of law. This is a uh, Putin is trying to prevent the uh, attempt by Ukraine uh, to integrate itself into Europe, and um, that is something that uh, we that the Ukrainians have correctly resisted and that we must do what we can to to assist them in that resistance. Um, but the point that I was making specifically is that I think that um, his claim that Ukraine is really Russian um, and um, his denial of Ukrainian nationality uh, is very much of a piece with the decline with the uh, denial of Polish nationality that they uh, Soviets engaged in in 1940. Um, it's enabled by our refusal to recognise that that's what has happened, and by the historical ignorance that surrounds it, and um, people not even knowing that part of what's now Ukraine was once Poland, for example, makes it makes it's extremely difficult to resist his claim that it's in fact all Russia. Um, and uh, what he's done, what they're doing now is very similar in nature. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the referendum in Crimea, Crimea was very similar in nature to the referendum in Lvov uh, in, in, um, in 1940, so um, in 1939 rather. Uh, and um, so that's really what I meant by saying that by, by having not called the Soviets to account for their crimes, um, which were, where they committed all the crimes of the Nuremberg defendants, the Soviets, and by not having uh, brought them to book for that, we've built the conditions for this, in my opinion. Yeah, um, I, I, perhaps I could add something about um, the origins of... Um, Putin's views about Ukrainians being really Russians. Uh, what he's done, uh, he seems to have reverted uh, uh, to ideas which are current, you know, before the Soviet Union, before the Soviet period. The, uh, these are Tsarist and Russian Orthodox religious views that all, uh, all Orthodox Slavs should be uh, obedient to the Tsar and to the Patriarch of Moscow. Uh, in the uh, late 18th and uh, 19th century, in the Russian Empire, um, uh, the uh, Rusins, as they call themselves in those days, the Rusins of Ukraine, um, uh, were uh, officially banned from speaking their own language. Uh, they were officially called Little Russians, uh, which is very patronizing. Uh, but in response to that, they began to call themselves Ukrainians, i.e. people of you from the Ukraine, Ukraine being a geographical area. Uh, and uh, their very identity <laughs> came from uh, their denial the, uh, of the official view that they were Russians. And lo and behold, in the 21st century, uh, you know, more than two centuries on, Putin is reverting to the same, you know, extreme views. Uh, but it's not just Putin. Uh, you know, the Patriarch of Moscow, uh, Kirill, um, has been blessing the Russian soldiers, uh, 
going to war in Ukraine. Uh, this is a sort of political, religious um, delusion, uh, but of very long standing. Incidentally, which the Soviet Union didn't support, that the, uh, uh, the so Soviet views of nationality were, were rather different. Maybe I'll move now to a question uh, posted by Dr. Hania Fedorovich, uh, which states, uh, Professor Davis mentioned the difference between the Jews of Zionist and the Jews of bound or assimilated, namely enlightened orientation. Would you consider it equally important to distinguish between the Piastowski and nationalistic uh, and Jagiellonian, which is multicultural orientation among Poles. Given the complex quadrant, would it be easier to be patriotic Polish Jew where the Jagiellonian view or similar Pilsudski was predominant? That's the question to Professor Davies. Gosh, um, <laughs> we need a bit more time to sort out some of those categories. The, um, the, the first category were, um, um, the Jewish, uh, the Enlightenment, the uh, masculine of the Haskalah. This is a late 18th century, 19th century movement uh, in, in European Jewry uh, to um, uh, often called assimilation, i.e. to uh, reduce the differences between the closed uh, Jewish religious society to enable people uh, to remain Jews, practicing Judaism, uh, but uh, working and living in the community at large. Um, uh, but now the, the Zionists are um, a feature of a, a later generation, namely the uh, early 20th century, and, uh, and they're not, um, as it were, um, differentiated from uh, the assimilated Jews. The, the, uh, the odd thing is, of course, many of the Zionists were themselves assimilated. They, um, they were, um, you know, their native language was, was German or, um, or Polish or Russian, um, or in some cases Ukrainian, uh, but they somehow resented, they were fighting against the assimilation which they had been um, uh, exposed to. Uh, but there, apart from the, the, the Zionists, there are lo lots of other Jewish groups you'd have to uh, take, into, uh, uh, take into account. Um, the Jewish community is extremely uh, diverse. Um, <laughs> there's not time to go into it all. Um, but uh, e equally, um, you know, the Poles have, um, uh, there's not many stereotypes fit, fit Poles, um, simply because it's a, uh, quite a big country, you know, 40 million people are not going to be, um, share the same opinions or um, be included in, in one or two categories. Um, uh Perhaps, actually, I would also refer again to the question posted earlier by Ms. Kristina Pirkowska, um, who uh, also that would be a question to Professor Davis. What do you think, in your opinion, were the reasons behind the U.S. initially help hiding uh, the Soviet Union, the, the, um, help hiding the, the U.S.S. are the cut in crime? Perhaps Stalin's appeasement was one of them. What about other reasons? Um, well, I think the basic reason uh, among the Western allies uh, um, during the Second World War uh, that they, um, uh, they thought probably correctly that uh, news of one of the, um, uh, of the allies, namely the Soviet Union, having murdered uh, tens of thousands of um, of officers of the another Western ally, Poland, uh, would um, you know would be a um, a moral stain stain on the movement. And um, uh, during the war, um, the Western allies were very keen on uh, presenting themselves, you know, as a force for good. 
fighting against you know the evil of of Hitlerism. Uh, and if it had become generally known that uh, one of the um, the allies, i.e. the Soviet Union, uh, although it wasn't a formal ally, but one of the uh, members of the Grand Alliance, as Churchill called it, um, was you know, led by a, a, a mass murderer, uh, the whole um, will to fight might have been affected. That, that's the, the basic reason. Uh, and this continued after the war. Uh, after the war, many Westerners were uh, very convinced that um, we had been fighting uh, for the good uh, against the evil. Uh, and so they, uh, they didn't want to talk. And they thought it was, um, was either untrue or they would be letting down the sign down by, um, by admitting to it. Um, in my view, uh, one of the, the, the main problems in, um, in, in discussing the Second World War is that people find it very difficult to understand uh, that there are two evil regimes pitted against in each other. Uh, people naturally like to think that one side is good and one side is bad. Uh, and on the Eastern Front, I, I can't see any um, uh, uh, highly moral um, uh, party. They, they, um, these were two evil monsters fighting each other to the death. And the fact that one of them won on the Eastern Front, now the Soviet Union, is why Putin uh, is able to... Uh, put forward, uh, you know, his, his monstrous theories. The, the Russians have not been um, reconstructed mentally in the way that the Germans have. Uh, after the German defeat, um, uh, Germany, the German nation as a whole, accepted the guilt of their forefathers. But something similar has never happened in Russia. Absolutely crucial. That's absolutely crucial point. Absolutely crucial. Thank you very much. I'm looking at our time and I see that is a little bit up. Let me maybe conclude by referring to a comment posted by Paul Coynes, uh, who says, who thanks you both for this uh, wonderful discussion. Sadly, he says, he adds that sadly, we do not teach world history in the US and so many Polish Americans do not know or understand their own history. Even sadder it is the total lack of understanding Polish Jewish relations. Politicians, editors, religious leaders all try to use sound bites to explain this with their own agenda. Denial is used by both parties to support their position as being the bigger victims. Open discussion like this may help, and Dr. Davis' books help greatly. Bardzo dziękuję. I think that this comment corresponds uh, greatly with the, the initiative, with, uh, that was the Professor Davis' initiative to start this project. Starting Poland Today series, which aims to increase awareness and increase knowledge and general understanding about Poland. And I'm sure that uh, throughout this series, uh, the, 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 the talks that were presented inspired uh, our viewers and the future viewers who will be watching the recordings of these programs on YouTube. Uh, they will inspire them to, to read and learn uh, more about, uh, about Poland. So with uh, this comment, I would like to uh, thank you uh, both very, very much for this fascinating, wonderful uh, dis discussion. Thank you, Lord Fingelstein, for contributing to our project and taking time out from your very busy schedule uh, and deliver your, your talk today. Uh, thank you, especially Professor Davis for, as I said, the initiative to start the entire project and for navigating and steering the entire season. Uh, which, which greatly contributed uh, to, as I said, uh, increasing knowledge about, about Poland. Um, this program also uh, concludes the foundation's uh, programs. Uh, this season will resume our online and in-person activities uh, after the summer. And now I would like to maybe wish you a great, uh, joyful, healthy summertime. <laughs> And we'll if, I, if I could just add, add a word to say that I've greatly enjoyed working with Eva and the Kostyushko Foundation. 
Uh, I think it's been a very fruitful series of, of meetings. Uh, I hope that something similar can be um, organized in the future. Uh, and in the meantime, if uh, anybody wishes to um, donate to our little foundation, uh, you'll see the website uh, www.polish-studies.org. There it is. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, uh, let's hope we meet again before long. Lovely. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.